Hello, and welcome to Pragmatic Live, Pragmatic Institute's webinar and podcast series, where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product teams. My name is Rebecca Caligeris. I am the Vice President of Marketing at Pragmatic Institute, and more importantly to you, host for today's event. Now, many of you are already familiar with Pragmatic Institute, but for those of you not aware of us until today, welcome to the family. Pragmatic Institute specializes in training companies on how to truly be truly market and data driven. We provide techniques for listening to the market and gathering market facts and key data, and then using that information to shape the strategies and drive execution. And we've been doing this and doing it quite successfully for over 25 years. Today, we are taking one of my favorite guests, the Chief Pricing Educator at Impact Pricing, Pragmatic Marketing or Pragmatic Institute instructor, and a good friend, Mark Steiling, is going to talk to us about one of the biggest changes that we've seen in the industry in the last 10 years, and that's really subscriptions. And he's going to talk about how to launch, grow, measure your subscription business um, across a variety of different industries and aspects. But real quick, before we get started, I do want to let you know that a recording of today's presentation and a copy of the slides will be available tomorrow, and we're going to send you a quick an email tomorrow with a link. And also be sure to stick around after the initial presentations, as Mark will be here to answer your most burning questions. And for those of you who have joined us before, you know that sometimes the greatest tidbits come out of those questions. He's also got a new tool for you guys to be able to download to use, um, so it's going to be a, good, a, a great presentation. All right. Enough housekeeping. Let's get this started, Mark. It's all yours. Well, thank you, Rebecca. And way to set the bar way too high. Thank you. <laughs> so let's talk about subscriptions today. Quick story for you. When I was teaching price for Pragmatic for, for many, many years, uh, I created the course. I love that course. People would often ask me, well, how is this different for, from subscriptions? And I would typically have some relatively flippant answer that says, you know, it's not that different. After I left Pragmatic um, full-time, I went out and started studying subscriptions. And oh my gosh, this has been such a fascinating ride. Um, and, and so there's a lot that's similar to what we teach in the price class. And then there's a lot that's dissimilar. And we're going to see what those are today as we go through today's class. Right, so first, what is a subscription? It's a periodic payment for frequent usage or benefits. You guys have all seen subscriptions like these. Uh, traditionally, we would pay to go to the gym or we would have a newspaper subscription. Even in the B2B world, there were subscriptions that we could sign up for. In the SaaS world, um, we have Microsoft. They've now gone uh, completely cloud-based. Uh, Adobe was one of the first to do that in the SaaS space. Salesforce was probably the first company that we say grew up in the cloud or was born in the cloud. Um, and so Salesforce was, has always been a SaaS-based type company. And then some of my favorites, uh, these are XAAS. Think of this as anything as a service. And could you make anything a subscription business? Well, Dollar Shave Club is a big deal. Um, if you think about Amazon Prime for a second, they're selling delivery as a service, um, as a subscription. Porsche. This has to be one of my all-time favorites. In Atlanta today, you could pay a, either a $2,000 a month subscription or a $3,000 a month subscription, and you have subscribed to Porsche. For $3,000 a month, you can drive any Porsche you want. You can take it back into the dealership and just get in a different Porsche and drive it off the lot. Uh, you can do that every day. It's pretty amazing. So one day you want to go to the mountains and you're going to drive a Cayenne. Another day you want to go racing around the, the racetracks, you get a Carrera. What are you going to do? So this is fascinating that you could take almost anything and make it a subscription. There's a couple companies that you kind of think of as subscription, uh, but, but they may not be officially subscription. We would still deal with them in a very similar way. Think about Uber and Lyft. We don't really subscribe to Uber. We usually pay by the usage, but the fact that we use it so often, especially if you live in New York City and you don't have a car, they want to treat this just like you would any other subscription type product. How is this different from traditional businesses? It turns out that in a traditional business, we've always had our product teams, product managers, product marketers, 
Uh, they create the tools to help out marketing, to help out salespeople. Marketing is then trying to help find potentials to go into the sales funnel. Salespeople are trying to nurture those potentials through the funnel, and eventually, out the bottom pops customers. This is the business that we would expect. What kind of KPIs would we use? Uh, we would measure revenue, cost of goods sold, maybe the cost of sales, and we end up with some profit margin, and we say, yep, this is a good business, we're, we're there. And now we want to grow our business. How do you grow it? Well, we throw more money at marketing and sales so that we can get more potentials and get them through the funnel so we win new customers. And that makes sense. We've all been exposed to this business. And we know this business relatively well. Now let's talk about subscriptions. What's different is, yeah, we still have a product team with product management, product marketing. They're helping the marketing team and the sales team. We're finding potentials. We're getting them into the funnel. And out the bottom, though, we're winning deals, but those deals are much smaller. We're only getting one month of revenue or maybe one year of revenue. Then what we have to do is we have to focus on how do we keep those customers. I want them to pay me month after month after month so that we can keep that revenue stream going. There's that negative thing called churn that we see falling out. We hate those. And the other bucket then is growing our customers. How do we get those customers that we have today to pay us more money? Think of these as the three revenue buckets. In traditional business, we only had the one revenue bucket. We had to win new customers. Now we have to win customers. We have to keep our customers. We have to grow our customers. In a lot of the subscription literature, you see those called acquisition, retention, and expansion. And we'll kind of bounce back and forth as we call them those three different things. How do we do this? One of the new things that happened because of the subscription world is we get this new department called customer success. We build customer success because we want to make sure that our customers are successful. That makes sense. And that way they're going to stay with us and pay us more money month after month, year after year. We also, by the way, need to spend resources on how do we take those same customers and get them to buy more from us, get them to spend more money with us. This is the basic framework that we're going to think about as we go through the day today. Let's see some early insights, and, uh, and some of these we'll, t we'll come back on or we'll circle back on. First big insight, cash flow is painful. Turns out that if you had a on-prem or perpetual license type business, you would sell it for some amount, and then they had that forever. Maybe we charge 20% maintenance fee year after year. If you were to take three years of that revenue, which is the upfront cost plus probably two years of maintenance, you add that together, you divide it by 36 months, that's how much revenue you get the first month. All of a sudden, we went from getting this really big number when we closed the deal to getting much, much smaller numbers month after month after month. This is painful, and we have to make sure we set expectations, especially with our executive teams, very carefully. Retention is crucial. Winning customers we know is important, but if we can't keep them, then we'll never be profitable. It'll never be a great business. We have to focus somehow on reducing churn Usage matters. <laughs> customer success is that new department. And if you think about customer success, they really have two big functions. One function is to make sure our customers are using our products. They're getting as much value as possible. The other function we often see in customer success is an onboarding function. As soon as a new customer signs up, how do we get them ramped up and using our product as quickly as possible they're much less likely to churn if we can get them to use our product. And then one of the really, really big ahas that's come to me since I've been studying this is expansion is way underemphasized. Expansion, that growing our current customers, 
we so tend to ignore it. Most companies tend to ignore it. And yet we're going to see that it is absolutely critical if we want to become a huge, successful organization. In general, we have three big pricing levers that we get to pull. Uh, I'm sorry, there's four. One is the price, of course. But the other three are the market segment, the packaging, and the pricing metrics. I call those pricing levers, but in truth, they're business levers. These are decisions, these are business decisions that we have to make that dramatically impact our pricing. The market segment that you choose, if we try to go after everybody all at once, we're not going to be focused, we're not going to succeed, we're going to see that there's some huge problems with that. Can we pick out the one market segment and then maybe grow to a second and a third market segment? The more focused we can be in our market segments, the more likely we are to truly deliver value to those customers and then be able to capture that value at the prices that we charge. The second one is packaging. I like to think of this as good, better, best. Anybody who's taken price from me knows that I talk about good, better, best a lot. In this case, we're going to think specifically about good, better, best, and options. What are we going to sell as an option versus having one of those different packages? As we grow as an organization, we start to form and mold and manipulate that good, better, best. And by the way, the good, better, best is probably different for the different market segments we would choose. One of the best things about software as a service, though, is we suddenly have this new pricing lever that we rarely had before, although even other companies can use it, and that is a pricing metric. A pricing metric is, what are we going to charge for? The most common pricing metric by far is users. We charge based on the number of people who use our product, who log into our product, but you could be charging like Dropbox, we're going to charge based on the amount of storage you use. Or we could be charging based on, if we think of someone like Constant Contact, the number of people in your email list. Um, we could be thinking about the number of API calls you use. We could be thinking about the number of uh, protocols we're running simultaneously. There's lots of different things that we could use as a pricing metric. And we think of a pricing metric as what do we charge for? In hardware, we've typically always charged for the item. Let's go back to Porsche for just a second. In the old days, Porsche would sell you a car and they would charge you for the car. But now instead of charging you for the car, they're probably just charging you for the usage of a car and they're probably limiting it to one car at a time. But it is no longer I'm selling you the car I'm just selling you access to the car. They would have a different pricing metric. When we think about this from a pricing perspective, it's absolutely crucial that we understand how our customers get value from our products because we want our pricing metrics to be highly correlated with the value our customers get. That way, as they use more of our product, they end up paying us more because they're using one of those pricing metrics. That's the basics of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to really look at two different stages of subscription businesses, an early stage and then a later stage to see how this is going to play and what we have to be focusing on. The KPIs that we want to deal with early on, I'm going to use just five basic KPIs. These are often called unit metrics in the subscription pricing business. I'm not going to go into detail about how to calculate them, but let me touch on each one real quickly. You've got the customer acquisition cost. This is typically the total marketing and sales dollars that we have divided by the number of new customers we acquired. And we have monthly recurring revenue. Sometimes you have annual recurring revenue, but this is the revenue that we expect to get month after month after month. We have monthly recurring revenue churn rates. How much of last month's revenue did we not get this month? That's because people stopped paying us. They stopped subscribing. The average revenue per subscriber, uh, sometimes this is average revenue per customer, average revenue per company, however you want to look at this for your company. 
Um, but this is just the total revenue divided by the total number of subscribers, and we get an average revenue per subscriber. Then a really important one is lifetime value of a customer. There are many different ways that you can calculate this. The easiest way to think about it is just take your average revenue per subscriber times whatever margin you have and divide that by your MRR churn rate, and you get some number of years. Well, if you're dividing by MRR churn rate, you get some number of months, uh, and you could divide that by 12, and you end up with a number of years. How, how long is somebody going to stay with us? Let's see these five KPIs in action. In 2011, HubSpot had the following unit metrics. Um, so they had a customer acquisition cost of 6,000, average revenue per subscriber of 429, MRR churn rate, 3.5%. That's a little high, I got to tell you. Uh, they're running really good margins at 83%, and they had a decent lifetime value of the customer there of 10,074. They went to their board, their investors, and they said, hey, look at this, we're profitable. Our lifetime value is over our customer acquisition cost. We probably ought to be ramping sales now. And the investor said, no, 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 slow down a little bit because we don't have enough yet. And there's another metric that is really, really vital, especially in the early stages, but, but people watch it even in the later stages as well. I call that the viability metric but the viability metric is calculated as the lifetime value of the customer divided by the customer acquisition cost. You can think of this as profitability. In that traditional business, we say the total deal size or revenue size, um, and then we subtracted out how much margin did we get, or we subtracted out all our total costs, and we said this is our margin. Is this a profitable business? Is this something we want to be doing? In the world of subscriptions, we do the exact same thing, but now we're using these metrics LTV over CAC to give us an indicator of what's the profitability of our business. And if we can't get LTV over CAC greater than three, then we probably have some work to do before it's time to ramp sales and marketing. Let's go back to our HubSpot example. The numbers haven't changed except we added on the far right-hand side, you'll see the LTV over CAC is now 1.67. We're not profitable enough. We're not viable enough. What we really need to do is find a way to get that lifetime value of our CAC number up. Turns out there's only two ways to increase your viability metric. You can either reduce your customer acquisition costs or you can increase the lifetime value of your customers. Makes sense. How do we do that? Probably the single easiest way to do that at this stage is make sure we're choosing the right market segment. When we have the right market segment, what ends up happening is we lower our customer acquisition cost because we're focusing our resources on that one market segment. We're going to be much more effective with the few resources that we have. And then if we've chosen the right market segment, that's the segment that actually gets the most value from our product. They're less likely to churn, which in turn is going to increase our lifetime value of our customer. You could think of this then as a product market price fit. You've all heard of product market fit and does that work? All we're adding here is we've got to have the price as part of that same equation to say, are people willing to pay us enough that the lifetime value of that customer becomes viable. If we go back to our HubSpot example then, by the beginning of 2012, they had a little bit higher customer acquisition costs. They had a little bit higher revenue per subscriber. Their churn rate went down pretty dramatically. Margin went down a little bit. Look at that lifetime value number, though. It went up a lot, and their LTV over CAC then, their viability metric, is now over 3. It's at 3.5. This is where the investors said, okay, go. It's time to ramp sales and marketing because we now know the formula. Let's turn the crank and bring more customers in because this is a profitable business. How did they actually do this, though? They did two really big, important things. 
they improved the onboarding of new subscribers. That increased the lifetime value, of the, or sorry, it increased the lifetime of a customer. It made them stay longer. They were less likely to churn. You can see that churn rate is down pretty dramatically. They targeted larger customers. Targeting larger customers does a bunch of things. It certainly increases your customer acquisition costs because it's harder to land them. It increases that average revenue per subscriber because we're getting bigger customers. That larger customer also helps reduce our churn rate because larger customers tend to churn less than smaller customers do. Uh, those higher customer acquisition costs and trying to onboard the customers brought up our margin, uh, so it made it a little bit more expensive, brought down our margin, brought up our expenses. But overall, the total lifetime value became a really high number, which made them very viable. This is a great example of what happens when you can focus on a market segment, then you can get your lifetime value over CAC up over that magic number of three. Uh, by the way, where does that magic number of three come from? I don't know. I have read so much from so many different investors, and everybody seems to say three is the magic number. So let's not argue with it. Let's just say three is the magic number, and we want our LTV over CAC to be over three. Miss Rebecca, do we have any questions? I'm happy to stop here for a moment and take a question or two. We sure do have questions. Um, so I think one of the things about the lifetime value to, to CAC and the, and the ratio there is um, if that's profitability, then how do you account for the cost of actually building and maintaining the product? If you remember the formula for lifetime value, it had in there the gross margin, and that is where you've built in the cost of, of running the product itself. So lifetime value in, in this model is based on uh, profit, not revenue. Yes, it's not just revenue. And then how much of this KPI work can or should be done during the product development stage pre-launch? Fabulous question. <laughs> that's, how, that's how Mark pauses and stalls to think of an answer. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, exactly. <laughs> I think like most of our businesses, we should have estimates of what we think those numbers are going to be and try to hit the numbers, try to hold ourselves accountable. But you can't measure those pre-launch by any means. Uh, in fact, what happens right after launch is it's really, really hard to get a lifetime value. You don't really know what the churn numbers are. It takes probably a year worth of operating the business before you start to get a feel for where your lifetime value is going to be um, for a given customer. I think that's very true, but I do think it's nice to set some of those goals up front, even if they're just sort of stakes in the ground estimates, like what am I working towards? What is my hypothesis of what those numbers will be? Um, and then you can refine those hypotheses over time. But it also lets everybody know and understand how we're going to look at it and define success. Oh, absolutely. I agree completely. And along with that, um, someone asked, they saw with, with the example you gave, the $6,000 customer acquisition cost, and is that normal? Um, and it's a, I think it's a question everybody tries to get when they first figure out their customer acquisition cost. Is like, is that, is that high or low? Um, and you're going to say the answer depends, right? And what, <laughs> what kind of factors does that depend on? It certainly depends. If you are going to have a direct sales force, that is a really big number, right? You probably don't want to have a direct sales force unless your uh, lifetime value of your customer is, a, is well over $10,000. Um, then it makes sense. If you're going to be well under 10000 so let's say that you are Calendly and you're selling to individual uh, small solopreneurs or small professionals, Every, your customer acquisition cost is probably relatively low. It's probably in the hundreds or less than a hundred because it's all digital marketing and hopefully we're being relatively effective with those numbers. It's not a salesperson making sales calls. Salespeople become very expensive and that's why that customer acquisition cost is so high. Depends on how active a sales force you have. Always. Sales process, not sales force, but yes. Yes, if, if we're out traveling and making cold calls and, and it's a long sale because we're trying to sell Salesforce to a huge company, 
then yep, absolutely. This is a this is a big customer acquisition cost. Um, and there's something that I don't have in the webinar today, but there's something that is pretty popular nowadays, which is called product-led growth. And product-led growth is where you use your product to try to win small customers without requiring a sales team. And then when it's time to get into the expansion phase, that's when we start moving salespeople in. Our customer acquisition costs then become relatively low, but we're spending uh, marketing and sales dollars in order to get the expansion piece. A great example of that is Zoom. Zoom is one of my favorite companies in the subscription world. And if you think about it, many people use Zoom for free. And as soon as you start using it and growing into your enterprise, now all of a sudden they've got salespeople calling on us, telling us why we need to buy a thousand seats for Zoom. So just so you know, Mark, before we go forward, I think you might be moving a little to and from your mic. And so the volume kind of drops up and down. Okay. So I'll stop still. walking back and forth. <laughs> Don't move. Uh, one more question before we go on. As, uh, we have a question about this lifetime value versus over CAC, and is that something that you can use even if it's not in subscription model? The answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Of course you can use it. I was trying to think of why you would want to. Um, the, oh, I think so. I mean, to me, it's a it's a metric that I use here. I use everywhere. It's still a matter of uh, the efficiency of which I um, the marketing and sales efforts versus the value, right? If it's if the ratio is too high, I'm probably actually leaving opportunities, and I'm not investing enough to go after more. If it's too low, then we're not being efficient in our spend. Maybe we need to tighten up on the market or other pieces. So. Yep, I agree with all of that. What was going through my mind is if I'm in a traditional type business, I'm going to sell an automobile. I'm not so worried about the lifetime value of a customer. I'm worried about that next transaction. Did I make profit on this transaction? Now, maybe I worry mm. about four years from now, am I getting the next deal or not? If you've got a customer, if you've got a marketplace where you're reselling to the same customer over and over and over again, absolutely. That's a, that's a really important metric for you. Awesome. All right, we have some more questions, but let's go ahead and, and keep going, and then we can hit some more. As well. Yep, perfect. Well, this is this was the part that I find amazingly different than traditional business, and that's how we want to grow our company. When you think about companies, uh, Bessemer Venture Partners put together this list of, of some some companies that are now public. How long did it take them to get from $1 million to $100 million ARR? So that's annual recurring revenue. Uh, you'll notice Slack did it in less than two years. Uh, Twilio was in the four-year range. Shopify out there in six years. Uh, Black Lines clear out at 13 years. There's a big range that's going on. What they did next, which I absolutely loved, was they went through and said, what are the averages? So they called it good, better, best, which of course I liked just the wording. But in the better category, you could think of this as the median number. So the median years to, from 1 million to 100 million was seven years. Then they have the 75th percentile. So these are the absolute best. That was five years. And then they had the 25th percentile, which were the laggards, but still it's not too bad to go from one to 100 million in 10 years. We'll take that. One reason I put this slide up is because it tells, it gives us a guidance to say, what are we shooting for as we're trying to grow our company? And I also want you all to just pay attention real briefly to this number. And that is the years from one to 10 million for the slower type companies, it took them four years. And I point that out because we're going to use that number again in just a few slides. Okay, you've said, yep, I want to grow my customers. And how do, I grow my cus how do I grow my company? There are really only two ways to grow a company. You can win new customers or you can grow your existing customers. Now notice the banner on the bottom. This is easiest when you keep your current customers. If we could keep our retention really high, so we keep churn down, 
then we can either focus on new customer acquisition as a growth mechanism, or we could focus on expansion. How do we get more money from our current customers as a growth mechanism? A company called ProfitWell, uh, used to be called Price Intelligently. These guys um, have a free product that if you're running a subscription business, I would, I would recommend that you use them. Uh, they have a free product where they look at all of your numbers that go through your company and they deliver back to you all of the KPIs that I've been talking about so far today. And one of the things that they did with all of their data analytics was they said inside their customer base, if we were to uh, increase by 1%, either acquisition or retention, or they called it monetization, but they mean the same thing as expansion, if I could improve any one of those by 1%, how much revenue impact would that have? What you can see by this chart is we end up with very low revenue impact with, if we just increase acquisition. And yet if we're able to increase retention, it goes up dramatically. And if we could increase monetization or expansion, it's even more. We should be thinking, how do we improve retention and improve expansion. This is where our real revenue growth is going to come from. There's another metric that's a, a crucial metric in this space, and it's called net dollar retention. It's a little bit confusing of a metric, so let me spend a few minutes to chat about it and see what it, what it really means. Let's say December 31st of, of the year prior. You've gotten really quiet again. I'm right in front of my mic, though. I don't know why. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. I'll, let's say December 31st on the year prior, um, I take all of the customers that I currently have, how much revenue they paid me, and I say this is how much revenue I expect to get from those customers in January if none of them leave and none of them grow with me. And I take that number and multiply it times 12. This is how much revenue we would expect to get in a year if none of those customers churned out and none of those customers grew. Of course, that's not what's going to ha that is not what is going to happen. We're going to have a bunch of customers that will churn out. And what we see is the little yellow in the bottom, that's the churn. The green that's above the line, the green that's still there, that's the amount of revenue that we get after churn. So think of that as retention revenue. But it turns out that we also are going to get growth revenue. We could get our current customers to pay us more money to buy more things from us. And that growth added to the, the light green, this is the total or actual revenue we get from that one cohort of customers. What's important to note is we're not counting any new customer acquisition here. This is just looking at one set of customers that existed at one point in time and watching those customers as we go forward in time for the next year. Then net dollar retention as an equation is simply the actual revenue we got divided by whatever that baseline was. What did we expect to have gotten? Any number over 100% says we grew any number under 100% said we shrank. Now, even if it's under 100%, we could make that up with new customer acquisition. It isn't the end of the world, but it's so much easier if we keep it over 100%. Now you're thinking, okay, what should I be shooting for? Well, here are some of my favorite companies. If you took a look at the S1 that each of these companies filed when they went public, they published what their net dollar retention rate was for the year prior to going public. And we have some pretty big numbers here. Uh, let's go back to Zoom as a decent example. They just went public and they had 142% net dollar retention. This means of the customers that started, let's say 2018 with them, of those customers, they got 142% more revenue than they would have if they had just bought the same as they bought the last month of the previous year. That's a lot. Okay, this is an eye chart, but, but stay calm. I'm going to teach this one to you. It'll be okay. Um, 
hopefully you're thinking to yourself, well, what should I be shooting for? Where are my numbers going to come into play? This is what's called the subscription growth calculator. And we put this together just so that you could understand what you wanted to do in terms of uh, customer acquisition growth, in terms of retention, in terms of expansion growth. What are the numbers that you want to shoot for in order to achieve the revenue goals of your company? And what we've done here, the way this works is on the left-hand side in those white boxes, that's where all of the inputs you would make on the spreadsheet would be. We're going to take a look at the initial assumptions first. And the initial assumption that really matters is we've got 83,000 in starting monthly revenue. And that's because times 12, that makes a million dollars. Um, the starting number of subscribers and the number of new subscribers in the first month isn't really important, but you want to put in what your actual numbers are as you go run, the, run this report, if you decide to do this. And then you'll notice at the bottom, I just highlighted a section that says year four, $10 million. What we're trying to do is say, what does it take if we were going to be in that good category for, from Bessemer Ventures Partners so that I could get from 1 million revenue to 10 million revenue in four years? The other numbers that I've put in, I assume the monthly sales growth rate is 2%. If you look towards the top right, you see the sales growth rate column year one through year five and a 2% monthly rate compounded monthly gives you a 27% annual sales growth rate. This is for new customer acquisition. Then we can take a look at the churn rate and at the expansion rate. And you'll see that I've got minus 1% for churn rate. Uh, the expansion rate I have at 4.2% right now. You can see the annual results at negative 11% for churn and a 64% and a for expansion. It turns out those two numbers, the MRR churn rate and the monthly expansion rates, those two numbers and the difference between them is what's going to define your net dollar retention rate. In order for us to get from one to, to 10 million in four years, we have about 123% net dollar retention. If you wanted to have Zoom type numbers, so you wanted that to be 142%, then the minus one, the, your churn rate plus your expansion rate needs to be equal to five. So if we had a churn rate of minus one, we would need a 6% expansion rate, and that would get us to 142% net dollar retention rate. The thing that I find really interesting about this, though, is we look out in year four, and 67% of our growth came from expansion. It came from that net dollar retention. It did not come from new customer acquisition. And in fact, as you look over time, the longer you've been in business, the more and more you need to focus on expansion as opposed to net dollar retention in order to get the growth numbers that we really, really want in our revenue. Okay, Rebecca, did we get any questions on this? I'm sure it was explained perfectly. <laughs> I mean, you were pretty brilliant. Uh, uh, so I do want to make sure everyone knows that you have graciously making this available afterwards. We'll send out a link in the email tomorrow, and you'll be able to download it. Uh, I did get a sneak peek of it. It's, it's pretty awesome. It's pretty powerful. Um, so that was definitely the question of the, can I use this? Uh, and can I share this with everyone I know? So there's lots of good questions there. So let's see. We have, um, we have some interesting kind of specific questions, less about the, the model than other pieces, but one of them is there, so is there sales on tax on subscriptions? Is there sales tax on subscriptions? Um, I do not know the answer, and I'm sure it's different based on state to state. Sure. Um, I, I tell you what, Rebecca, if we're going to have questions that aren't on this, I think there's maybe two slides left to go. Okay, well, let's do that. Let's finish this up, and then we'll take a, as many questions as we want. All right. Sounds good. I just wanted to make sure that I had this covered as well as I could.
So you've now, let's say that you go through the subscription growth calculator, you say to yourself, okay, I need to focus on expansion. I need to grow my customers. How do you do that? Turns out there are four different ways that you can grow a customer. You can raise prices, of course. We can increase their usage and hopefully get to be able to be paid more because they're using more of our product. We could upsell them into more capabilities and we could cross sell them, meaning they're gonna buy products that are in the same category, but not directly related to what we sell them today. We could tie these directly back to those three levers that we talked about earlier today. We talked about having uh, market segments, packaging and pricing metrics. Let's start with raising prices. Raising prices becomes so much easier when we understand the market segments that we're building for. In fact, if we start splitting into different market segments, we could probably find segments that would pay us even more than we charge today, have the ability to raise prices on those segments. You've added more and more features to your product over time. That should justify some price increases. In fact, I don't know about you guys that are listening, but I can tell you that probably half of the subscriptions that I have and that I pay for have raised my price in the last year. This is not an uncommon thing, uh, so we should be thinking about it. Usage on the left. Usage is directly tied to pricing metrics. If we've chosen the right pricing metrics, so let's say that we're gonna use the common one users, as a company grows and they hire more people, and more people use our product, they're getting more value and they're paying us more money because usage has gone up. They get more licenses for the product. Upsell. This is directly related to the packaging piece. When we talked earlier about good, better, best, oftentimes when somebody first starts using our product, they buy the good package because they wanna test it out, they wanna see if it's gonna work for them, and they quickly realize, wow, this is really awesome, and I want more, they upsell, in, they upsell themselves or they buy up into the better category or the best category, or they buy some of our options. If we've structured that packaging well, we have the ability to upsell our customers. And then the final one isn't in the three levers, this is cross-sell. This is what we as companies tend to do anyway, where we build a new product line or we build a brand new product, because they're using this, they trust us as a company, they might be more likely to try one of our other products. And this is where we would think of cross-sell. If you were to go to the Salesforce webpage today, uh, we think of them as a CRM tool maybe, there's a list of 16 different products you could buy from them. Those are all cross-sells as opposed to upsells. So what are the next steps? What am I gonna recommend that you go do at this point in time? I would recommend that you download the subscription growth calculator. Uh, Rebecca will send you out the link tomorrow. Um, if you can't wait, you can get it at impactpricing.com slash SGC. Fill it out with your numbers. And then if you really want to, book a time to review it with me. I'm happy to, to chat with you for a few minutes and the link is in the spreadsheet. You'll see a link on how to book a time with me in that spreadsheet if you'd like to do that. Okay, Rebecca, I'm sure we only have one or two questions, right? We've got lots of super awesome questions. <laughs> uh, one of them was, what are the subtle differences or are there subtle differences between B2B and B2C subscriptions? Oh my gosh, I think it's hugely different. Um, I think in B2B, we have the sales force. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the product-led growth piece where we often lead with people coming in to buy our product and then we're willing to send a sales force out to land the really, really big deals, the huge enterprise deals. I think that is a huge difference between B2B and B2C. Um, I think the, the basic structure of what we talked about is probably pretty similar in B2C, as in you've got those same three pricing levers that you can use. It would be the same way to grow a customer, but you don't have the, the huge wins with the huge enterprise customers in the B2C world. And then, um, okay, so how long can you, there's a question of can you depend on expansion benefits perpetually, right? Is there a point where, uh, kind of level off and, and it 
um, there's only so much you can get. <laughs> I don't know. They can only milk so much from that stone. <laughs> um. To be fair, they wrote the question way better than I just said it. <laughs> to be super clear. <laughs> There, there's probably a limit to it. However, what's going on over time is you are constantly adding new capabilities, new features to your products. Hopefully you're out listening to the marketplace, you're learning what's changing, what are the new problems that are coming out, and you're adding those capabilities onto your product. If you're thinking carefully and you're truly solving customer problems, there may never be a limit to this. Um, you know, the most you could get is the, the revenue your customer makes in the B2B world. But um, I, I think you've got a lot of potential and it's going to be hard to find the top. Okay. Well, is there a point though, like as you do new features, uh, some of those features you can charge for and some just needs to feel like part of in product improvement. How do you differentiate those? Does it feel like you're just sort of continually nickel and diming them? What are the, how do you make that balance? Yeah, I think the hardest decisions to make, the hardest thing to do in everything that we just talked about is figuring out which features go in which packages. This is not a trivial task by any means. It is not uncommon to say, I'm going to take these new features and stick them into a package and then later I'll raise the price of that package because I added new capabilities to it, because I put those new features in um, over time. The real answer to the question, how do I decide what I'm going to do with a new feature, or even if I wanted to restructure my feature set today and I want to create a new good, better, best type package, it really depends upon the relative preference of the feature for the markets that we're look, looking at and the overall customer's willingness to pay for the product. There's a, a way to do survey statistics analytics to figure this out. Um, there's a way to do it rule of thumb that says, I think everybody needs this, therefore I'm going to put it in my good package. I'm going to put it in my base package. And you might say, I think this is only used by a few people and the few people who use it have huge willingness to pay, therefore I'm going to put it in my best package or maybe I'm going to make it an option. But this is, without a doubt, that is the hardest decision to make. Um, and it, I think it's always changing. It and is. Yeah, yeah. And you have to look at uh, factors internally with your customers and also with your competitors and what they're offering. Yes. So this is a huge question. Uh, how do you determine the right price for your subscriptions? <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a good question, but it's a big one. Well, first thing I would do is take the Pragmatic Marketing Price course. Oh, that's great. I like that answer. <laughs> There are survey methodologies that you can use. The thing that I love, uh, there was a, a statement by Jim Geisman that I really liked, and he said, that, oh, okay, I'm going to confuse my quotes, I'm sorry. Jim's quote was, the best pricing metric is the one that makes sense to the customer. It's Patrick Campbell at ProfitWell had a great quote that said, if you have the right pricing metric, it makes up for having the wrong price. It's sometimes hard to get the price right, the actual number, the dollar value, but if we can make sure we're charging for the right things, as people use more and more of our products, they're going to be willing to pay us more and more. You'll notice that prices in the subscription world go up dramatically. And when I say that, think of a company that first came out, they've got really aggressive low prices, but over time, they figured out how to market, how to segment their markets, how to create more value, how to communicate that value, and then they figured out how to raise their prices because they're doing that. We, we should be thinking the same thing and testing our prices regularly. One of the things that's different about subscription, and you hear this in a lot of the investors, the private equity firms that invest in companies that do subscriptions, that is, in a traditional business, we often use the set it and forget it rule for pricing. In subscriptions, we've, we're constantly tweaking things. We're tweaking what our packages look like. We're, tw we're tweaking the price levels that we have, uh, the price points we use. It is, it is never done. 
it is always a process. So I think when we think about subscriptions, we often think about some of the big companies that you talked about that, have, that started from the ground up as subscription. But I know we have lots of clients uh, who are and who are currently kind of moving from an on-premise or perpetual license, enterprise license model to a subscription model. And as they make that change, uh, what other KPIs should they be watching? How can they help educate their internal um a management about how expectations need to change. This is such a huge change. Oftentimes what companies think is that um, I used to charge this much for my perpetual license, I'll divide it by 35 and that's my monthly price and I'll, now I'm a subscription. Turns out that's not the way subscriptions work at all. We have to change almost the entire company. The billing structures that we use changes, the cash flow that we're going to have changes, the way we constantly tweak our products are going to change, especially if we go to a cloud-based solution for something like that. The fact that we're now watching usage, we're monitoring usage, we're driving usage, uh, making sure that people are using our products is a really important deal. It changes the entire company. It's not just a piece of it. My recommendation is when they first go subscription, go in parallel. Launch the subscription solution, uh, sell it to a set of clients, a set of customers, uh, maybe transition or migrate a few customers, but don't, don't uh, pull the lever and go all the way in right away because they're going to find that there's so many things they didn't think about and they're not ready for. Mm, that's good advice. All right, we have so many questions, Mark. I'm asking. <laughs> uh, what about the easy ones. when you're going in a B2B environment and you've started with a SaaS uh, subscription model, rather, whether it's um, moving your core product to subscription or adding a subscription piece to it, how do you prepare the sales force? There's a lot of different answers to that question. I think the biggest problem with salespeople and subscriptions is what does the commission structure look like? Salespeople care a lot about how they get paid and what they're going to get paid for. What we need to do is make sure that we've compensated the sales team in a, in a fair way. This is so hard. I'll tell you who this is hardest on is the CFO. What we often do is if we could try to compensate our sales team based on a three year value of a customer or maybe if we know what the lifetime value of the customer might be, we could try to compensate them on, on that number. But the finance people makes them really antsy because we're compensating salespeople on revenue that we haven't gotten yet. And, and that's a, it's a pretty challenging thing for them to accept. I would say that's the biggest issue. A lot of the other things in, in subscription is so much easier. If I'm a salesperson, I would much rather sell a subscription because it's easier for buyers to buy. They're only committing to one month or one year instead of some huge capital investment. We're putting it on operating expenses instead of capital expenses. I can tell you that over time, the product is going to be better because the company, the, the selling company cares about usage, which means we have to make our product better and better and better so that our customers will use it. The product will end up being better over time than if we just sell a, a perpetual license for the product. There are lots of advantages to going subscription. Um, it's easier to sell. I think as a salesperson, they would much rather do it. That sales commission piece is the hardest piece to tackle. And just since you brought up our friends in finance, uh, there were a couple of questions earlier about getting the information to calculate uh, customer acquisition costs and some of the other pieces. Uh, and talking about business analysts, and actually I think customer acquisition cost uh, is among the easiest because it is all sales and marketing spend, um, and so your finance team is actually <laughs> is actually the quick win uh, since they do budget expense there, so just to answer that question. Yes. Um, okay, so this is a good question. Uh, in the instance of a hardware-based company adding a software service, uh, the products are complementary, supporting total increased revenue per user. Do you still use different pricing metrics for the hardware and software size of the solution, or do you look at it at, um, more holistically? Uh, it depends upon how many guts you have. 
So, so we're back to uh, risk and finance people. Their job is to mitigate risk. Oftentimes, hardware companies will um, sell the piece of hardware, and then they sell a license, a subscription to the software capabilities on top of that. Um, I, I put on a Ring doorbell in my house, and I bought the doorbell, and I pay Ring a monthly fee so that they will store my videos or something like that. Right? However, they could have said, look, we're just going to give you the Ring doorbell if you sign up for this subscription. And they would easily cover their hardware costs. How, you know, how often am I going to change a doorbell? Right? Not very often. So it, it's a matter of can you accurately calculate lifetime value? Can you control people from signing up and canceling after a month and, and not being paid back the value of the hardware? I mean, you've got a higher risk level than a pure software company has. Great. Um, oh, wait, right. here's a good question about how do you test subscription pricing? What's a, a good way to test pricing and, and kind of hone in on the right level? There's actually a lot of people that disagree with this. I mean, let me say it differently. There's two different sides to this coin, but it is not uncommon to just charge different prices in different uh, regions, in different um, circumstances. If you do that, though, you have to keep track of who you showed which prices to so that you're consistent with those people. I mean, it's not that hard to test subscription prices to increase price. One of my favorite things is uh, to say is if you're in a subscription and you want to increase prices or you want to see if a price increase is going to hurt, then um, first off, you know you don't have to increase prices on current customers. You could just increase prices on new customers. They didn't even know you used to have a lower price. So that was, an, that was a no-brainer. That one was easy. And then oftentimes I'm asked, how do I increase prices on my current customers? If it's a pretty big price increase, what I would probably do is take a subset of those customers, maybe 10% or some uh, number, and increase prices on them and seeing what the response looks like. Do they complain a lot? How many of them churn out? What was the hit to me if I raised their price? And then if that worked okay, I can just run the math and say, yep, I want to roll that out to everybody, or no, I'm going to roll that back and not increase prices on my current customers. There are methods you can use to test the, the subscription prices. Hmm, okay. So it says when moving from perpetual to subscription licensing uh, and changing the pricing metrics, and you talked about kind of running those both parallel, what um, is it important to, should it, I think they're asking is, should you position it as the same product moved to a different pricing model, a la Microsoft Office, or do you want to try to differentiate the two so there's less price comparison? I'm not sure that there's an, there's an either or answer there. If I were taking a perpetual product and moving it to the cloud, what I would end up doing is not developing the perpetual product anymore. I wouldn't be putting enhancements on that and just putting all new enhancements in the cloud product. Over time, they would be dramatically different products. How we present it to our customers is this is the future. This is the way it's going to go. Uh, you're welcome to stick with your perpetual product for now. We don't mind. But, uh, but someday you're going to want to switch back over to this platform, and here's what it's going to look like. And I, I mean, I'm not sure how else to answer that question. All right, so we're coming up at the top of the hour. And there's still lots of questions, but if everything we've talked about, all, the thing, all your ideas, uh, if you could give people two things to have them start thinking about or doing differently tomorrow based on what you're talking about today, uh, what would it be? The first one's really easy. I would conscientiously break my business up into three revenue buckets, acquisition, retention, and expansion. And I would ask myself, am I focused, which revenue bucket am I focused on with this activity? And am I ignoring any of those buckets? Because you can't, you really can't ignore any of them. If you ignore any, it's going to be expansion and you'll ignore that at the detriment of growth, but you won't get in trouble for it, I guess I should say. 
Um, so I would absolutely break my, my work up into those three. And then the third, the, the second thing I would do is I would start to focus more on expansion, try to figure out how I could grow my current customers. And I say that because almost everybody ignores that bucket. And it's probably the most powerful bucket out there for you. All right, Mark. Thank you. That was awesome. I know everyone's super excited to get the slides. I know everyone's excited to get in, dig into your spreadsheet. Um, I'm sure they'll have questions for you, and I know you will be very uh, gracious and helpful in answering them. So thank you for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. I had a great time. Good. All right, don't forget to join us next month, August 21st, when we have a little fun using improv to build up our soft skills with Elizabeth Hodes from HIL Training. So that will be fun as well. All right, so that does it for this edition of Pragmatic Live. Thank you for joining us, and have a great rest of the week.